Uh, my name is Ben Fuchs. I'd like to just say a big welcome on behalf of Elemental. Elemental is the, the online community for uh, professionals focused on heat, water, air and energy and looking at how we effectively manage these uh, vital resources in the built environment both now and in the future. So we've got a fantastic panel assembled for you today which I'll, I'll hand over to Tom uh, Reynolds in a moment who will be will be chairing the discussion. Um, just before I do so, I'd just like to launch a quick uh, poll for the uh, audience. We'd love to hear you know, what, what brings you here, if you like, what is best described sort of your role in the industry, um, manufacturers, uh, interested other parties, are you a consumer, an installer, a specifier? Um, so just let us know, we'll, we'll, we'll load that up. Um, we'll also, as we go through the panel, we'd love to hear your questions as well. So there's a QA and a uh, feature at the bottom uh, of your screen. So please do ask your questions um, in there and we'll, we'll try and pick those up um, as we go. Um, but for now, let me uh, just, just say a quick thank you on behalf of Elemental sort of for being here. And also a big thank you to Tom Reynolds, who will be um, chairing the discussion. Tom is Chief Executive of the Bathroom Manufacturers Association, the BMA. Um, with that, uh, let me just end the poll. Uh, what have we got? Yes, some interested others and um, a number of manufacturers. So, so, so there we go. That was what the people who, who, who have just joined and, and clicked the answers have said there. With that, Tom, over to you. Thank you, Ben. Um, as Ben said, I'm Tom Reynolds, Chief Executive of the Bathroom Manufacturers Association. Uh, we're a trade body of over 50 companies that supply bathroom fixtures and fittings to the UK marketplace. The Construction Leadership Council recently gained the backing of over 50 organisations, including us at the BMA, for an ambitious retrofit programme that seeks significant improvement to the levels of water use and energy efficiency in the UK housing stock. And coupled with this, the Energy Saving Trust has reported that British bathrooms account for the majority of homes' water demand, as well as a significant proportion of total energy consumption. So in this session, our panel are going to be looking at how the construction sector and its supply chain can create and harness solutions that reduce our environmental impact, taking into consideration, of course, the vital influence of consumer behaviour. I'm joined by an extremely distinguished panel uh, who I know will spearhead a lively discussion. So uh, just introducing them, Tim Pollard runs Pollard and Pollard, Pollard Consultancy. Um, which is a business operating in the fields of energy efficiency, sustainability and public affairs. He also provides presentations and speeches on these subjects at events throughout Europe and is a regular contributor to journals and in other media. And before setting up as a consultant, Tim spent 30 years with Woolsey UK. Rosanna Lorne is a Global Brand and Strategic Partnerships Director at Project Utopia. Um, the company specialises in modular homes and schools that combine energy efficient passive design, affordability, rapid construction, renewable energy generation and storage and heating and cooling systems. Project Utopia is currently working to fulfil seven of the UN 17 sustainable development goals through its product range. Dr. Joe Patterson has been a research fellow at the Welsh School of Architecture at Cardiff University for over 20 years. Her research experience in sustainability in the built environment with a particular focus on energy has led um, a broad range of multidisciplinary research projects in uh, low carbon and sustainable built environments over the, uh, this 20 years, uh, which uh, have involved many UK and European uh, researchers and industrial partners. Representing our session sponsors, Triton Showers, our marketing director, Tina Simpson, and campaign manager, Anna Nich Nikolic. Triton uh, was founded in 1975 and has become one of the UK's market leading shower brands. It's part of the Norcross group of companies and Triton's well-known product, product range is manufactured in Warwickshire. Um, 
Back in 2014, the company became members of the Made in Britain scheme, which celebrates British manufacturing. And of course, Triton are uh, also a member of the BMA. And finally, uh, Jacob Tompkins is Chief Technology Officer of the Water Retail Company. Uh, Jacob has a distinguished career in the world of water, including posts at Imperial College, the NFU and Water UK. Um, in 2005, he founded Waterwise, the water efficiency NGO, which he led for 12 years. And at his current company, the water retail company, Jacob's focus is on how the application of tech can benefit customers in the, and the environment. So during a, a physical event, this is where I, I'd normally ask for a round of applause to welcome our panelists. But as we're online, let's get straight into the debate. So Jacob, coming to you first, what's the scale of the problem with water and energy consumption in UK homes and what makes this issue so urgent? It's a huge problem and it is generally understated. So on average, every single person in the UK uses about 141 litres every day. Think about how much water that is. Think about that in one litre bottles, 140 of those, uh, a lot of water. And that's a lot more than our European counterparts. Germany's down to around 120, parts of Denmark are 100. So we're using a lot more water than we, than we need to. And that's partly because our bathrooms and the, <laughs> the way we use them probably needs upgrading. Um, in terms of water stress, climate change, population growth, the way we use water means that by 2050, the amount of available water will have reduced by 10 to 15%. And it's already on a knife edge. It, it doesn't seem like it, it seems like it rains all the time, but actually parts of the UK are semi-arid and we have less available water per person than Italy or Spain or Portugal. It, it is a very, very important topic that will constrain growth in the UK at some point um, and also will lead to damage to the natural environment. But it's just not talked about very much. I mean, one of the reasons that BMA is so interested in water efficiency and, and the water scarcity issues is that our members' products rely on a secure supply of water in order to be able to function. So. Um, you know, some of the, the events in, in Surrey last year with the, uh, the, the wildfires out of control really do underscore that point you make about us having a, an arid environment. Tim, uh, yeah. energy is a much more pub publicised issue, but can you kind of just talk to that um, and just why, why is the, the energy consumption issue so important too? Sure contributes around 40% of the UK's carbon footprint uh, and almost half of that is the energy used within the buildings themselves. Uh, heating alone accounts for 19% of the nation's carbon footprint and uh, homes are actually the most significant of all those buildings. Homes account for 77%, uh, commercial buildings 14% and public buildings 10%. Um, a building's Efficiency is the ability of the different components within the building to retain heat and, of course, to some degree, uh, light. This includes the efficiency of the building envelope, where we're looking at uh, wall, floor, loft insulation, double glazing, draft proofing, and, of course, uh, the heating appliances and the heating distribution systems themselves. Um, the issue is that uh, although, of course, modern homes are a lot more efficient these days, uh, by 2050, 80% of the buildings which were standing, will be standing then, are standing now. So our real challenge is to address the uh, massive buildings which are out there. We have an incredibly rich history in terms of house building and indeed commercial building. So, there, there's no set answer, there's no silver bullet. Uh, each home is an individual challenge in itself. Each building is an individual challenge. And of course, we are quite unique in Europe in having such a very high percentage of, of buildings that are owned by the occupiers. Uh, and that itself means that uh, we're gonna have to be able to convince those people <laughs> that it's a good thing to spend some money and it is gonna require some investment 
in order to, to make their buildings more efficient uh, and what that might mean for them. Uh, and, uh, and I'm passionate in believing that we have to be able to do that in a way that isn't going to uh, cause people to wear uh, horsehair shirts. It's, it's going to be a, a, a process which is easy, although it is going to be disturbing. It, it, it's going to be different. It doesn't have to be worse. And uh, that, that is, I think, is the big challenge for the future. Just um, before we move on to the, the next question, Tim, if I could ask you to comment on um, the Environmental Audit Committee over the, uh, the course of the last few days has said that the Green Homes Grant was a completely botched scheme. Is that what you mean when, when you, you talk about making things kind of work for the, the consumer in upgrading their homes? It's got to be not just good policy, but well implemented too. Uh, absolutely, and, and I, I, I'm still bearing the scars of, of the Green Deal, which uh, uh, is, is, live, will live with me forever. Um, uh, we do have to make it an easy step for people, um, but I, I, I'm not sure that necessarily it has to be, you know, a, a sort of financial bribe almost. I, I think it has to be an easy route. And, and to do that, we really have to be able to convince not only the consumers themselves, but the entire supply chain, uh, amongst which I, I believe installers will be the, the key people. They are the people who have face-to-face -face consumer contact. They are the people who have the expertise and they are the people who are going to install these things at the end of the day. And if we don't carry them with us and we don't convince them, then frankly, uh, we ain't going to do it. Thanks, Tim. What sustainability trends are we seeing in the housing market at the moment? Uh, Tina, is this something you're considering in, in marketing at Triton? Yes, it's something we have to be aware of. I mean, we did a survey last autumn amongst 2000 consumers trying to poll their opinions on the importance of sustainability in their lives. They seem to sort of phrase it of somebody else's responsibility though. So it's the house builder's responsibility to be build clean homes or it's the manufacturer's responsibility to develop eco-friendly products. Was, I think it was almost 90% of consumers thought it was the manufacturer's responsibility. So I think from our perspective, our marketing has to help consumers to make better choices and do simple things that are easy to digest. So recently we've done things like a water savings video We've done infographics. Um, Anna organised a survey recently looking about people's changing habits during lockdown. And it was something like 70% of people said they use more water now. So I think from a marketing perspective, it's helping consumers make good choices, but portraying the information in a way that is short and snappy and easy for people to, to digest. I think if you throw too much information at people, they do switch off fairly quickly. So what we've been trying to do is little bit, little sound bites that help us to help consumers make better decisions, but also feel that they can be involved in the process and take responsibility as well. And of course, Triton displays the, the unified water label uh, as well, we which do. is um, a, uh, a system where you can share information with consumers on the water using properties uh, of the, the, the equipment. So uh, yeah, the, yeah a, a, a great supporter of that scheme. Yeah, absolutely. It's very important that consumers can see things and benchmark products as well. Excellent. Joanne, are there any um, particular kind of verticals within the housing market, for, for want of a better uh, way of putting things, that are displaying particular trends? I think we've always seen a trend, particularly with related to energy um, savings and sustainability, um, just based on single um, single solutions to retrofitting. So it has been tended to be a more blanket approach for loft insulation or cavity wall insulation. Um, I, obviously, to achieve the, the net zero targets that are being set now, we need to be much, the trend needs to change and it needs to be much more of a whole house approach which Bayes is starting to look at through its three um three billion pound funding that is recently announced so i think this whole house approach needs to be that is the only way to achieve the, the the net zero targets that have been set um with regards to sort of technologies obviously air source heat pumps has been seen as a kind of key way of moving forward at the moment it's something that people are interested in 
bit, a bit of a mixed message going out about whether gas boilers are going to be phased out or not. And I think that's scaring a lot of social housing companies as to where to go in the future with regards to air or heat, heating systems in general. Um, and obviously, the, the whole house approach is really important here because you, if you install an air source heat pump without having all other measures on a house that might not be insulated very well, then it, although you might be helping the decarb agenda, you might be creating fuel poverty issues with the occupants living in those homes. So I think there is a real need to be careful when you are following trends in that you could be improving the decarbonisation, but having an impact on other sustainability elements, such as um, so the social elements, such as conditions for occupants and energy bills. So that's really quite important. So uh, in terms of the, the, the trends which you're, you're seeing emerging, are they going far enough? You know, uh, how, how can we really start to, to see it, achieve a, a sea change really, particularly yeah, I, in the I, area of social housing? A big thing to help encourage the change is to provide evidence on how the solutions actually work in practice. And there is a trend, you know, another trend that's coming through is to, it, to install intelligent energy systems to monitor how the, the technologies actually work in practice. And obviously that is critical, but I think there is a worrying concern, well, a bit of a concern that these intelligent energy systems are seen as let's let's install it, we'll put it in and then it's there and it's fine. So I think there is a, a, a situation where we need to gather that evidence and interpret it and make sure the monitoring data is actually being used as well as collected. Because you can collect anything for as much as you want, but if you don't use what you're collecting, then it's kind of useless. So there is a real need to, to gather this evidence to illustrate to the wider housing sector, particularly social housing, because they can drive the market as to what installing sustainable measures can actually achieve for not only carbon reductions, but the wider benefits for the, the occupants, that built environment as a whole. Excellent. Um, I, I'm just, uh, I, I've seen a, a question come in on the Q&A, which um, I think I, I'm gonna pose uh, at this point, because I think it fits quite neatly with our discussion, where, um, uh, someone called MB uh, has said Green Deal, Eco, Forest Boilers, nearly all seem to be flawed through their complexity. Um, it, Tim, from your kind of perspective, do you do you share that that analysis? And how do we? More to the point, how do we make things better going forward? Uh, well, the, the first thing I'd say is is make sure you consult with the people who are going to have to deal with it. Uh, so, uh, principally the installers, but uh, other parts of the supply chain too. Um, I, I think there's always going to be a tension between uh, what governments see as a priority, which is of course to provide the best value for 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 the taxpayers, um, and to ensure that there's no abuse of the system, and there has been abuse of the, of some of the systems in the past and the uh, requirement to get on with it, frankly. And I think uh, certainly that the evidence which we've just seen uh, of, of the current round is that it has been so complicated, so many steps in, that, that people have just given up, frankly. And, and I've seen that happen before. Um, I was involved very heavily with Green Deal right from the very sort of beginning of the story. And, and as every page turned over, you thought, oh no, Oh, no, 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 don't do that. No, please don't do that. But unfortunately, they did and, and uh, ruined the scheme, which I thought would potentially could work. So uh, what I would plea for is please, 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 before you enter into it, have a really good consultation with the people who are involved, not, you know, <laughs> civil servants and, and policy wonks, People who are out there on the tools, doing the job every day, who are going to be responsible for delivering that with consumers. Thanks, Tim. And that brings us quite neatly, actually, onto the um, national retrofit strategy, which is something that I mentioned in my introduction. Uh, the rationale for the NRS is, is pretty straightforward in that our homes contribute 20% of the nation's carbon emissions. And it's essential if we're going to you know lower that figure that um we start to retrofit them and at scale um the strategy has been fully costed and offers a roadmap on how government can help to create a low carbon built environment by 2040 
the essence of it is that if we're going to retrofit the 28 million homes um, that already exist, it needs to be treated very much as a national infrastructure project. And the CLC's uh, national retrofit strategy really provides a, a ready-made solution to government on how to take that forward and showcase um, to, to the rest of the world at COP26 in November, how you can go around transfor transforming your um, existing housing. It detail, the NRS details the investment by government would be need to be 5.6 um, billion pounds over four years, but that's the pump prime hundreds of billions of further private investment over the course of the next 20 years. And um, it's about building capacity to, to in order to, to scale the, 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 uh, the extent of retrofit, not least through the establishment of a retrofit delivery authority. It's a huge undertaking. Um, that's not without significant challenges. So if I could just ask uh, on the, the topic of water, Jacob, what do you see as the, the, the main ways that we can overcome those challenges if we are going to achieve the, the ambition set out in the NRS? Well, first of all, it's amazing to see a national retrofit strategy that actually includes water. So well done to you and everyone else who's been lobbying to get water in there. Um, I, I find it amazing that in all of these strategies or retrofit programs, generally water is either ignored or is an afterthought, given that it's, you know, heating water in the home is at least 1% of total UK carbon emissions. Um, the other thing that I see is a lot of the space heating and a lot of the insulation retrofits are expensive, difficult to do, whereas water is very simple in comparison. You know, refitting new showers, adapting shower heads, putting in tap inserts, changing toilet flushes, are relatively cheap and relatively easy to do in comparison to the other things, but they have generally been ignored. So a strategy that combines the two and makes sure that the plumbing side of a natural of a, of a national refit strategy is included is, is essential. And I also think that there is there's a large agenda from water utilities at the moment to try and reduce water consumption. It's cheaper for them to reduce water consumption than to create new supply. So there are willing allies in the water industry to help deliver these sorts of programs. And when we tried to do this before, about 15 years ago, there was a ridiculous government clause called the additionality clause, which meant that you couldn't use the same money to do both water and energy. Thank God that's gone now. But I think partnership between water utilities, product manufacturers, housing developers uh, would deliver more than the sum of their parts. So my, my plea is, yes, include water and include all bits of the water sector. Joanne, you, you've already mentioned whole house approach and that's fundamental really to, to the national retrofit strategy. What are the barriers uh, that are stopping a, a whole house approach at the moment that, that you think need to be addressed? I think it's a lack of skills. I think there's a definite lack of skills across the board. And I don't think, I think it is, yeah, from, from, from the research, from the work with the retrofits that we've carried out, there is that it's more of the management element of the retrofit and the, the ensuring that, that those, all of those trades people come in at the right time and understand what else is happening in the whole house retrofit so that they don't replicate work or do things that the that might cost more money further down the line in the retrofit so it's having that no regrets approach and that has to be managed well by somebody that understands the, the whole package of works so i think there is a real um yeah a real need for the, the skill market you know to, to to think of the skills sector and construction sector with regards to skills very differently going forwards Thanks, Joanne. And then Rosanna, I, I saw you you nodding along to, to that point from Joanne. Do, do, do you want to kind of elaborate there? Yeah, I think um, what Joanne's, um, you know, touching on is definitely relevant. When you retrofit a home, especially ones that are, you know, pre, uh, pre kind of 80s, they have a lot of different trades and a lot of different requirements, and this can be quite expensive. 
effective to do. And um, one of the things that we're looking at doing to try and um, help that management or at least mitigate some of the costs or reduce, you know, the expense that Jacob touched on is looking at how we can use a technology first um, approach. For instance, installing sensors in the home, in every room and understanding actually what that home's doing, what, 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 um, what rooms are you know, leaking, what rooms are warm, what rooms are doing this, what rooms are doing that, so that you can actually have a much more strategic and structured approach to it, rather than going kind of like, this is everything that we need to do in a retrofit, like let's go and do it. It's going, okay, actually, how is the home working? And then how can we interpret that data so that we only do what's absolutely required to be done um, and we do it efficiently and effectively um, you might find that some of your rooms in your house don't really have any cold walls and there, for instance, you may, you may not need to insulate those rooms, but that approach can just very much be like whole hog and I, it's completely unnecessary and it drives the expense of the retrofit up and it, it, it can make it inaccessible for um, a lot of people. So we're really looking at, you know, how we can use technology and data to um, really strategize and structure how we approach it. Um, and then the other thing that we're looking at as well, which, which touches on is, is the expense is actually how can we get these into the into the market using funding options that perhaps aren't reliant on government um for instance are there manufacturers who provide some sort of capital allowances for say housing associations so they can pay it back over a period of time um can we can we partner with those you know to get the initial capex and the initial um systems within the home um rather than them going oh god it's 40 grand and um, how are we going to pay for that? So we're looking at, you know, different structures, different strategies that makes it easy accessible. It helps people understand actually how their homes are working. I don't think, I don't think it's really possible without, you know, a lot of this live data to really fully understand what that home needs. So it's about bringing all these together and actually really leaning on technology um, because we have it, it's there and it does wonderful things and we should be using it to, to, to be able to move forward properly in the industry. Thanks, Rosanna. That's certainly something we recognise on um, one of our particular campaigning issues, which um, relates to, to leaking uh, toilet valves. You know, that, that we're, we're currently um, in the middle of a, a campaign to try and help consumers to get lavy savvy around the maintenance behaviours that are needed on, on WCs. Uh, but there, actually, there, there's some great technology out there that um, provides uh, data where, when a leak does occur straight to the consumer, so they're alerted the minute a leaky loo is happening. Um, but you know, at the moment, that technology rollout is really in its infancy, so we'd like to see that accelerated. Um, Tim, if I can come to you uh, to just discuss the, uh, what the, what are the supply chain implications of having such a large retrofit strategy. How, what are the challenges that we need to overcome right from the manufacturer uh, through our supply chain partners in merchants, for instance? Uh, absolutely, a, a, cr a critical role, clearly, and and, and you, you know what you have to understand is that uh, it, it's a bit like the, the a great ocean liner. You can't turn these things around in in five minutes. You know, there's huge amounts of stock out there, huge amounts of training. Let's not forget, you, you know, whenever you bring a a different product out or even a new product, it, you require to train the people uh, at every stage, the people who make them, the people who sell them, the people who who buy them and fit them and the people who use them at the end of the day. So uh, the, the supply chain in itself is, a, is absolutely critical to the delivery of, of any strategy. And, uh, but I, I, I would just like to sort of go back and, and, and re-emphasize that point, you know, that an awful lot of consumers don't understand where they're using their energy or even what energy is, you know, it, it took me uh, nearly 10 years to convince the government that heat was energy, but, uh, and I think we've got to try to make it quite clear in very simple terms. And I think one of the failings of the industry, uh, because we're all professionals, we all understand the technology and the lingo, you know, uh, I think professions tend to protect themselves with lingo, don't they? But what we've got to do is to, in layman's terms, explain to people, what they can do, what it's going to cost, what it's going to mean for them, and what the result is. I, I don't think anybody, you know, doesn't want to help. I think everybody wants to be a bit of a hero. Everybody wants to make their, you know, play their role, play a contributing part in, in, in this role. Uh, and I think, you know, there's a lot of goodwill out there. But unless we can explain it in really basic, simple terms, then I, I think we're going to find it difficult. 
So demystification on our hands. Absolutely. So um, if I can come to you next, Rosanna, to, um, Utopia has some, some great experience in um, basically greening the, the new build sector. I just wondered what um, challenges differ between retrofit and new build and where you think there can be an exchange of best practice between the two different parts of the construction sector. I think it um, boils down to actually what Tim's saying. For, for instance, in the new build sector, we will build the homes to the specification to be, you know, um, energy positive or, you know, aiming net zero, whatever it is. And the, the consumer will come in and they'll buy that home specified as it is. And they'll know that, you know, they might be able to get a green mortgage on it or they might be able to do this or the, or the home works to this level. Um, when you're actually integrating into the retrofit market, it's getting people to understand what you're doing. You don't really have to do that with new, new home builders because we're finding at the moment, a lot of, um, uh, sorry, new homeowners, a lot of our new home um, clients and things like that aren't actually coming to us at the moment for our energy credentials. It's a lot more um, superficial than that. Is you know, is it the right size house in the right location at the right price at the, exactly the right time that they need? So that's what's really driving their motivation for buying an Utopia home at the moment. And the eco-credentials are you know, just a bonus to them. Um, when it's retrofit, you're selling the eco-credentials. You're trying to um, you know, educate them in why it's important for them to do this. And that is, that is definitely the difference between the two. It's you know, the product's already sewn up and done and people buy the full package. In the retrofit market, it's actually trying to convince people to buy the package and why it's important to their life. Um, and, and, and yeah, that's definitely where we see the, the disconnect. Now, some of the things that, you know we're looking at is how we take the technologies that we're using in the new build sector so for instance we use air source heat pumps um we use sensoring and smart home systems uh we use um you know batteries solar etc and how we can just take that model that we've created that works really well and look at how we can apply it to a retrofit um environment but then you start getting into as we discussed earlier the fuel, po fuel poverty issues you know gas is so much cheaper than electricity. You can't just install an air source heat pump and go, you, you know, you're, you're reducing your energy efficiency and, you know, you might reduce your house bills. No, you won't. Because if, it's, if you don't have a battery and you don't have solar and you don't have all of these different things, you're actually going to increase your bills. So it's about debunking these different conversations. It's a lot easier to package something that's pre-built than to try and sell something new to people who've had a traditional or a certain way of living for so long. And that's, that's the difference between the two, I think. I, I get a sense for, from that, actually, if we return it again to, to that point Joanne made earlier about a whole house approach and, and having it just very crystal clear how you, you would go about a, a, a meaningful retrofit that, that works in the way that you want it to. Um, on this point, whose responsibility is it to, to instigate and improve the energy and water performance of, of our buildings? Uh, I sp suspect there's going to be a range of answers here, um, but you know what really needs to be done by each of those actors. Anna, can I come to you first because Triton are, are, are making some efforts to help consumers, aren't they? Yeah, for sure. So I, I think this is um, definitely a shared responsibility, but I think um, a, I guess a very important point is that we can only really do so much as um, a manufacturer. We can make eco products. Um, but at the end of the day, um, how end user uses that product is contributes massively to um, whether this problem changes or not. Um, and we have done some research in, in about 64% of people um, don't actually know how much water they're using in the household um, or how much energy they're using in the household. And that is really quite a high number. Um, so with our campaign and um, as part of it, we just decided to make it a bit more transparent to people and just get them to understand um, how their home is contributing, um, how different habits that they have around the house, particularly around showering, could contribute to that number and also um, help them sort of give them some tips on how they could um, reduce that. Um, so I, I guess big part of um, our campaign was um, energy and water saving calculator that we created, whereby every individual can just answer a few very quick questions um, around their habits around household and stuff, uh, and especially their showering habits. And then they can see 
exactly how much water they're using, exactly how much energy they're using, how they're contributing to carbon footprint, um, and get some easy tips on, on easy fixes on how to get those numbers um, lower. So consumers and, and users of our, our products have a, a clear responsibility. Tim, who else's responsibility is driving change? <laughs> yes. Is the answer to that? I think uh, virtually everyone really is. Um, uh, everybody has a role to play, um, uh, but I think, uh, in particular, you know, we, what, what we and I just repeat myself, we've got to make it quite easy to understand. Um, I, I worked, I chaired the, the group which which worked very hard to get the water label introduced in the first place. It's now the unified water label. And the beauty of that is that it's very easy to understand, isn't it? You know, I know an A is better than a B and a B is better than a C. And I think that in itself is going to be one of the um, uh, easy ways to deliver a message. Just to, just to go back to what the previous speaker said, I, I was surprised so many people understood how much water they used, frankly, and how much energy they used. I, I, I think uh, if you asked the vast majority of people, they wouldn't have the, 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 the foggiest idea. So uh, of providing that, I also think there's a, a, quite a, a, an interesting role in, in actually the, the process is you know in itself subject to resource efficiency. The amount of packaging that's used in, in, in delivering product, the product itself, I was delighted to see um, a move by the government to encourage repair rather than replace. And I, I think if, if you, uh, if, if you go to the Dutch and you see how they view construction, they view a building as being the next building supply chain. You know, what can I take out of that building and reuse it in the next building? I, I think we, we, we've been far too much of a disposable society, if you like. And I think when we look at efficiency, we've got to look at resources. It's not just carbon, it's the whole thing. We've got to understand where we can improve our processes and our behavior, don't forget, human behavior is in itself a, a, a massive contributor. And th in that way, we can perhaps deliver some real meaningful change without necessarily spending a, a vast amount of money. In fact, maybe even saving a bit of money. Thanks, Tim. Um, so, t Tina, coming to you, um, as a manufacturer, how do you see uh, manufacturers' role in all of this? I think to pick up on Tim's point, the process is really important, thinking about our process and our supply chain. Um, so I guess there's two levels. There's a corporate level um, where we need to think about our own impact as a company. Um, so we've got an internal team that's looking at all elements like Tim mentioned from packaging to design of products to look at how we can improve and to help us on that journey. We've signed up with the Carbon Trust. So we want to try to be carbon neutral next year and then net zero by 2025. So I think there's a company stance that we need to take, but also then looking at how we can help people change behavior. In the survey I mentioned earlier, 26% of consumers thought there was no such thing as water waste. And it does seem like water is, is almost taken for granted as a resource. People don't think about it in the same way. So again, it's our job to work with our customers, installers to help them educate the consumer, with our specifiers to make better choices. And also with our product development, what can we do differently that will lower the impact of our products on the market? So I think we're thinking of it in those dual ways as a company, what we can do, looking at products like electric showers, which are very efficient, how we make those move forward. Electric showers can be seen as the should we say the, um, the undervalued product? Because everybody likes the big heads, the chrome, the bucket spray heads, but they're not very environmentally friendly from a water usage, whereas electric showers can be. So just helping change those perceptions really and doing what we can to help educate. Joanna, you sit uh, as a lecturer at the Welsh School of Architecture. What do the um, role does the, the designers, installers and uh, people in the, the, the whole kind of construction uh, arena play in, in achieving a transformation? I think I think there's a critical role for the obviously a critical role for the designer because, um, you know, like, well, as we it, but it, it's more than just the typical architecture approach. And I think uh, architects and m &E, um, mechanical and engineers and, and everybody needs to work much more closely together because of the wider range of options that, that are available now. And I think I think there there are 
critical points within both a new build and a retrofit where the right choices have to be made as to what fits together well, not only for the, the geographical location, but also for the type of occupant that's going to be living in a particular building. Um, you know, if you've got elderly occupants living in a house, then that 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 building requires different and it's a completely different energy pattern to some a family with a work well in, in the old days <laughs> pre-covid of a family working and in school so i think that and those have a big impact on energy demand and where your energy is going to come and whether you need storage so it is the the designer much more broader than an architect needs to work together um, uh, uh, right across the installation process as well, because if the products aren't installed properly and commissioned properly, then if they don't work as they should and as they've been designed to, then you aren't generally saving any, any energy and you can also be creating issues for the occupants. So maybe, you know, if the ventilation systems aren't installed correctly, you could be creating unhealthy environments for people to live in. So there is a real need for working along the whole design, installation and operation process together. Thanks, Joanne. I mean, we're, we're recording this on the, the 12 month anniversary of the, the first uh, COVID lockdown. And one, one of the things that occurs to me is that the, the response to the pandemic by different local authorities, the Volvo administrations and national government can sometimes create a, a tension in, in decision making. And that, that's not limited to, to pandemic response. That's also running through other policy areas like um, like around retrofit. Rosanna, fr from your point of view, um, how does the market know what to do when you do have that tension? Um. It's quite a good question. So the future home standard recently, um, the second draft has come out for the built environment. And um, I don't know if you remember, but the first draft didn't really give the power to the local authorities to actually benchmark where they wanted their sustainability delivery to be for communities. It was kind of a blanket level. And some of the local authorities have been pushing for a much higher standard. Um, and essentially what this um, new kind of policy did was actually reduce what they were striving for so that the house builders could you know escape through on the skin of the teeth again and just do the bare minimum um, which is something that's quite known within the housing um, industry that a lot of um, especially the volume house builders um, that they, they they focus a lot on their bottom line they do minimum standard just to get through policy um, etc etc that's not the attitude that we need when we're pushing towards a sustainable future um, so thankfully the new future home standard has allowed local authorities to take control back for their you know their areas and actually how they want sustainability to be delivered um, but i generally think you know picking up from the consumer angle as well like house builders and um, developers will always try and find or, or a large majority so i'm not going to put everyone in that box we'll try and find the loopholes within policy um, to deliver as little as possible to generate as much profit as possible and that's just notoriously how they've worked um, what we're kind of seeing now is that they, they will only change their behavior if consumer demands it it's the same as any any other industry isn't it if your consumer demands it and they start going and looking for sustainable buildings because they get cheaper mortgages or they care about their carbon footprint etc etc then the, the suppliers have to up their game don't they so i think it's a hand in hand you know you've got the policy there who who deals with um, and, and puts a benchmark and really drives that and the future home standard has been actually the new version has actually been quite good for that. Um, you've got the house builders who actually need to be a bit more aspirational about what they deliver and realize they're building homes for people that actually are gonna live in them for years and they need to be quality. And we've got, you know, the planet and the people to care about. But then you've got um, on top of that consumers who actually need to be, you know, understanding all this information so that they can purchase correctly. If, if for instance, you get a premium for an energy efficient home, House builders will start building their homes energy efficiently. It's just going to happen. So there's this there's this loop that we kind of are playing with all the time to to make this work. Um, but yeah, essentially, I think um, I think it's uh, from my perspective that's something that I see quite regularly, and that's something that has to be dealt with quite quite um, you know it has to be balanced to be able to get the results that we need. And uh, I think the, the the same applies even for retrofit. If uh, you know uh, your EPC performance became the the main decision or one of the main critical decision making factors when you're, you're purchasing uh, a, an existing property, 
then uh, you know that's going to drive improvements in retrofit too, isn't it? And I, I think there's, there's definitely a debate to be had on um, the EPC and how and whether it should be improved. Uh, Jake, um, Tim, you you gave me a nod there. Do you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, I've always thought the EPC actually had a, a tremendous opportunity to become the currency of sustainability, if you like. It, it's, a, it's the note that everyone understands. However, in its current form, I, I don't want to be overcritical, but I think uh, we've all heard the tales of drive-by assessments, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, I know my, my, I'm, I'm at the moment standing in a, a home which has an A rating, but I have absolutely no idea how. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is, um, and I'm sorry to go back, but installers, you know, it, when you look at the cost of an installer becoming accredited for a particular technology, um, we actually did a calculation to work out how much it would cost to become uh, number one registered to fit gas appliances and gas boilers. £16,000 is the answer to that, which kind of took my breath away. Um, but then, you know, if you wanted them to, to, to add renewables on top of that, then you would have to become MCS accredited, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of that is a very substantial amount of money for what is largely an industry made up of one man businesses. And if you're going to try and, and get these guys to, to become ticketed to fit the heat pumps, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you're going to have to convince them that there will be a market there, that there will be demand. Otherwise, they're shelling out for something which they're never going to use. And that is going to be absolutely critical. So, um, uh, you know, uh, back to the old story, it has to be everybody. Otherwise, one link in the chain which fails will be enough to stop it. Jacob, I'm just going to come to you to, to comment on water and then we're going to have some uh, audience questions because there's some really insightful questions which have come in uh, on the, the Q&A. So, um, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier the water company willingness um, to, to get stuck into the, this agenda. Do you want to comment a little bit further on how partnerships are the way forward? Yeah, I mean, this sort of fits in with what Rosanna was saying. So there are incentives for house builders and developers to, to build better in terms of water efficiency. So there's something called the water infrastructure charge. So when you build a new building, you have to pay to get it connected to sewerage networks and, and water networks. And some companies, Seven Trent, for instance, are offering reductions in that charge if you put in water efficient devices. So it's just cash, basically. And, and that sort of thing should be driving developers to fit new technologies, to fit more water efficient technologies. So I'm suggesting that there needs to be more collaboration between developers, manufacturers, and water companies. And this is where something like the unified water label is perfect because it can say, if you're this level on the unified water label, fit that in your house, you get a reduction in your infrastructure charge. And, and you know, you're talking several thousand pounds. So this is, there are drivers that we in different bits of industry can do without having to rely on ridiculously over complex government schemes. Just linking these bits together and using existing stuff, I think we can make some good progress. Yeah, go ahead, Rosanna. I was just going to comment on the fact that we've seen this in the electric car vehicle, the EV um, industry, haven't we? There's a ton of incentives for people who've got an EV. Like I've I've got an EV and I don't pay congestion charge in London. I can park it for thirty pounds a year or something ridiculous outside my house. I can, you know, don't pay road tax, don't do this, don't do that. Um, we need to see these incentives in this industry. We need to be lobbying. We need to be pushing for these kinds of incentives because, you know, one of the great things that I love about some of Tesla's advertising, just before you go into the, um, kind of come into central London, they've got a big billboard that says Tesla no congestion charge, and like that's brilliant marketing, isn't it? Because people, this is what people think about people care about and we need to start pushing for this kind of stuff within the you know the house building retrofit all of these different industries because that's what a lot of the time makes people wake up absolutely and uh, you know I, I, i'm currently on a waiting list to get my ev because it's become such a, a an aspirational product a product i've got to wait 10 months to get one um and this really speaks to a, a question from uh, chris taylor hamlin 
who asks, how do you manage um, aspirational home improvement plans? And this is very much a, a point that Tina raised around the, the kind of gi giant shower heads, for instance, uh, and, and the, the need to, to retrofit green products, um, which might be perceived as giving a poorer performance. How do you kind of redress that balance? And I'm going to come back to Tina um, as you kind of touched on this previously. I think we, we, we have to acknowledge that consumers will all make, always make their own sustainability choices in the house. So they may opt for that big shower head, but make a choice elsewhere in the house that makes them feel better. So I think there is that balance. I think the other thing we need to do as manufacturers is demonstrate you can buy eco products and they're not more expensive because there is a big perception that if you do, if you do an eco and you're buying an eco product, you're gonna be paying a premium. And we found that in the research we did. So I think it's, it's educating people that you can make those choices and they don't have to be an expensive choice to do it. And we, we've just moved into a new house and we've been having similar conversations about lighting and things like that, that we want to upgrade. And, and when you do your research, you, know, you, can, you can access affordable products. So it's making it easy for consumers to access a type of information and know they can do good things at home. And one also, of the, oh, go on. sorry, go I ahead, just, Rosa. I was just going to say, I also think it's down to lifestyle, like letting people know, you know, if you do this, it's not going to make your life any more inconvenient or anything like that. You know, it, it could almost be a swap out that doesn't even touch the sides, for instance, like a boiler to an air source heat pump. Um, I mean, obviously there's an expense and things, but it's about that whole, you know, it's not going to make your life any less convenient. If we do it properly, it could make your life more convenient. So it's letting people know that they don't have to, you know, there's a lot of things going on around, you know, not eating meat for the environment, not doing this, not doing that. We're not talking about drastic life changes. We're talking about, you know, you can continue to live your life how you are, but we just, we can just change these few things that makes your life and your, and your carbon footprint reduced, if that makes sense. Jacob. Hello. Yeah, sorry. Uh, a lot of this is around language as well. I mean, with showers, there was a there was a change probably about 10 years ago from having dials that said normal and eco yeah, to normal and boost. So instead of calling the eco eco, you just call the normal, the eco normal. And then you yeah. call what was previously the normal boost because nobody wants to switch their shower to the eco setting. Because immediately they're going to think, OK, that's going to be worse. They want to switch it to the boost. And you see all this around the advertising. But just renaming this and renormalizing the eco stuff. So, you know, don't don't call it an eco shower. Just call oh, yeah. it a normal, high quality, excellent shower. And, and this is happening. A lot of manufacturers now um, have as standard these eco settings. And, and I think this normalization and change of language um, and, and that's what's happened with the electric cars. I mean, all the adverts you see on the television now are, are for EVs. And it, it's just become normalised, which is why you've got the waiting list. Indeed. Well, yeah, I, I think you, you've touched on a point there, Jacob, that Mick Moran's made in the chat as well, which is around green products shouldn't um, deliver a poor performance. And so yeah. one of the things that I, my eyes have been opened up to since joining the BMA is that actually there's some really... Uh, energy and water efficient products out there that deliver an outstanding performance to the consumer. So uh, it, it's not necessarily a trade-off. Um, I've got a, a question which I do want to ask the panelists before we, we move on to wrap up um, around um, will a labor market, um, a market shortage be a challenge to delivering uh, the national retrofit and build back better schemes? Uh, and this is a particular concern in uh, the world of, uh, of plumbing, um, but uh, in uh, all parts of the construction industry, really. Uh, Joanne, do you want to comment on that one? Yeah, it's a huge problem and it is right across the construction sector. I think the construction sector needs to change calling itself a construction sector. Well, it, it is a construction sector, but I think it needs to, the, the whole sector needs to be low carbon or driving towards net zero. It shouldn't be seen as two separate sectors. Um, so, and I think that, I mean, in the, the recent budget, there were a few um, things to stimulate change, you know, there were, I think there was training and um, uh, apprenticeships available for flexi working and enabling, you know, young people to train up in maybe two areas, which would really help to them for them to understand maybe the plumbing side and the, 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 the more traditional 
built trade sectors and I think having that cross sector understanding will really help but there is I mean I think it's about 30 percent of the construction sector are due to retire in the next five or ten years that's a huge drop in in people and you know people on the ground and that gap needs to be filled and filled quickly and the only way to fill it coming back to, to Tim's point around the, the cost of uh, of actually getting accredited to, to fit different things is to make sure there's a market there otherwise people won't come into the industry so um, yeah crucial one I'm going to cram one more uh, audience question in before we do around the table to, to wrap up uh, and that's are there any specific measurements um, i.e taxonomy or standards in place to test housing energy efficiency and i'm going to tack onto that question water efficiency as well uh tim you've got a uh, great history here so um i'll uh, i'll let you answer that one uh, well the the answer is yes of course um uh, I, I, and but i think the challenge as always is to make sure that it's in a form that everyone can understand and everyone can contribute to uh, we've seen all sorts of standards uh, both within our own country and and elsewhere uh, passive house is 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 being one which is which has made a lot of ground um you, you mentioned EPCs before, and of course the, the commercial equivalents as well. So yes, the, the, there is methodology, but I, I think the you know one of the things that I was quite keen and, and uh, to, to, to stress is there's nothing like experiencing it yourself, is there? To me, you know, one of the we, we talked about the products which which are which are great. The problem is. Um, people hear these things, don't they? Oh, it's the green, it's worse. You know, oh, I don't like that. I need a shower that delivers, you know, 20 zillion billion gallons a second in order for it to be something I enjoy. So I think one of the nice ways to do it would be uh, to allow people to experience these things first. Uh, and they can then have the evidence of those standards about what, what it delivers and the way it delivers. The, the EPC is, I think, a brilliant concept, just needs to be done properly. Uh, but if we could do that, then we would generally have a dialogue and generally provide people with the reason not to do it rather than the reason to do it. Thanks, Tim. We've got just a couple of minutes left. So I'm going to ask um, the, our panelists to round off what I think has been a really fruitful discussion uh, with a, a very brief kind of rapid fire answer. Um, in just one sentence, could you just say what you think is the most important element to making tangible improvements to water and uh, energy um, usage in our homes, whether it be products, infrastructure or behavioural changes? So th the unlucky person that I'm going to ask first is going to be Anna, I'm afraid. I, I think it would be uh, behavioural changes, if I'm honest. So. I think un unless if we change that, we can't really um, make a massive difference. Okay, behavioural changes. Rosanna? Um, I actually think um, product is one of the key things. If you can create a product that doesn't require a huge amount of behavioural change to actually use it, it just requires an install and it's intuitive enough, then perhaps that's a quicker way to get to market. Okay. Thank you, Rosanna. Jacob? Um, all the bits are there. It's just collaboration. Collaboration. Tim? Uh, clear and precise information that's available and that everybody can understand. Thank you. Uh, Joanne? Um, communicate, communicate, communicate. I think if people share information along the, along the journey, then I think that really helps things to be delivered to, to provide a successful um, net zero built environment. Thank you. And last but not least, Tina. Left me nothing to say now, so <laughs> I just agree with all of the panellists. <laughs> no, I think I think communication is key, whether it's talking about a product that you don't have to change behaviour or telling people that are upgrading in their home because they need to adapt their behaviour or could adapt their behaviour a little bit as well. Fabulous. Well, that has brought us roughly to the hour. Um, so in winding up, I want to thank um, particularly our, our panellists, but Triton Showers for, for making this discussion possible. Uh, and I, I'm going to briefly hand over to Tina uh, on behalf of Triton to, to finish the discussion. So Tina. 
Yeah, I just wanted to thank the panelists and Tom for participating today. It's been a really enjoyable conversation and I've learned a lot as well. I've been writing notes as well as I go through. So for us, it's given us some great insights and some great contacts. And I'd just like to thank you all very much for giving up an hour of your very, very valuable time. Thanks, and thank you everyone in the audience for joining us as well. Um, hopefully you've uh, found it a beneficial discussion.